Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Wednesday Morning Devo and Encouragement. Thank you guys for joining and listening at any time today. Um, I hope you guys are encouraged um, by these, by these uh, scripture readings um, and devotionals with them. I um, pray that you guys are having a good Wednesday and have a blessed day to praise the Lord um, to glorify Him and to enjoy Him. All right. So let us read. Today we are looking at Jesus' calling, Christ's calling of the disciple Matthew, or Levi, as he was called. Um, so here we are. Luke 5, uh, 27 through 32. Christ's calling of the disciple Matthew. After this, he went out and saw a tax collector named Levi, Matthew, sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. And leaving everything, he rose and followed him. And Matthew made him a great feast in his house. And there was a large company of tax collectors and others reclining at, ta at the table with him. And the Pharisees and their disciples, uh, and Pharisees and their scribes, sorry, grumbled at his disciples, saying, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus answered them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick... He says, I have come to call the righteous, or I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you for um, the stories of your son, Jesus Christ, that we have so many that we can look to and see how Jesus lived and how we can follow after your son, follow after you, Lord God. Um, as our treasure, as our king, that we can follow after you and we can learn from how you interacted with people, how you um, saved people, Lord God, how you call people to follow you, that we would follow after you the same way. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Wednesday Morning Devo and Encouragement. We're looking at Christ's calling of the disciple Matthew in Luke 5, 27-32. It's an awesome story, really awesome story, and I didn't pick it just because Matthew is my name as well, um, but I picked it uh, just because um, the last two verses in here, verse 31 and 32, really stuck out to me this week. Um, also, I was I had watched watched the rest of The Chosen, finished the series of The Chosen maybe a couple weeks ago, and I think the second to last episode of the season, episode 7, um, was The Calling of Matthew, episode 6 or 7, and it's so good. So good how they portrayed Jesus' calling of Matthew and the character arc that Matthew got in that whole first series. So I encourage you guys to watch it. They portray really well and stick to um, the portrayal and the character that are in the Bible while adding their own narrative as well. But very, very well put. Um, the Chosen. So Jesus calls Levi or Matthew. So Levi was his <coughs> Jewish name. Right, and so Levi was his Jewish name, and so then he goes by Matthew, so that way he doesn't get as much backlash. He doesn't get as much um, uh, slander because he was his disciple that so many people slandered and hated, anyways, because of him being a tax collector, right? So he goes by his Roman name, Matthew. <clears throat> and so at first, it starts out with after all these things. So there's a lot of things that Jesus has done already, right? There's a lot of things that has happened to Jesus, especially just in this chapter, Luke chapter 5. He gets up to this point. We see Luke's account say that Jesus has already dealt with the paralytic, right? The paralytic man was right before this um, while he was teaching. He was interrupted with that. Um, he's already dealt with a leper, um, he's called his, his other disciples. He's called four other disciples. Um, he's called the fishermen. He's called quite a few of them. Um, and, he's already, and he has already dealt with a demon-possessed lady as well. So he was ready for a tax collector now, right? After all these things, he was ready. A um, little biblical humor, just put it there. <laughs> all right, so a tax collector named Matthew, right? Um in that day, as you guys may know, um, especially if you watch The Chosen, you can really see that for sure, that being a tax collector in that day was very, 
it was a good profession because you were probably rich, um, but you were going to be despised by everybody. You were going to be despised as traitors and extortioners. Because the Jewish people rightly considered them traitors because they worked for the Roman government and they were Jewish people by themselves. They were Jewish people who uh, betrayed their people and are going to work for the Roman government to extort from their own people. They had force of the Roman soldiers behind them to make people pay their taxes, to force them to pay them and even more what they had. So they were the most visible Jewish traitors with Rome in all the land. The Jewish people rightly considered them extortioners because they would keep whatever they overcharged, and they overcharged a lot. A tax collector bid against others for the tax collecting contract. All right, so they each got these tax collecting contracts and bid against other tax collectors. The Romans awarded the contract to the highest bidder. All right, so the man collected taxes, paid the Romans what he promised, and kept the remainder. So they were extortioners to the greatest form of that word. There was great motivation for being a tax collector because you could overcharge and cheat in any way that you could. It was purely profit for these tax collectors. Um, the writer Lane, he says, when a Jew entered the customs service, he was regarded as an outcast from society. He was disqualified as a judge or a witness in a court session he was excommunicated from the synagogue, and in the eyes of the community, his disgrace extended to his family. Mm. So hard, hard things that happened to a tax collector here. One other writer in Barclay, he says a Roman writer tells us that he once saw a monument to an honest tax collector. An honest specimen of this renegade profession was so rare that he received a monument. Wow. So we see the the uh, the the form behind being a tax collector, what it means to be a tax collector, and how different it was, how they were truly extortionists and betrayers of their own people, for they were with the Romans and they were able to tell. Like you can, um, I like what they uh, show in the Chosen is that um, also the tax collectors were maybe informants to the Roman people to say when things were going down that they knew weren't lawful. Um, like um, in there, um, Matthew realizes that some of the fishermen um, are fishing on Sabbat, on the Sabbath, on the Sabbath night when they're not supposed to. So that way they can have an extra day to try and fish and gain more profit for their families, to feed their families. But Matthew, being the extortionist, he's going to tell the Romans about all this that is happening. Right? So it is extremely... A, a extreme betrayal of their own people because they are Jewish themselves and they're giving up all their people for their own wealth, for their own gain. So, a very selfish position, but we see the implications of that today in other people, right? In other forms of jobs in today's world as well. So, that is what a tax collector is. Tax collector Matthew also called Levi, or Levi Matthew, because Levi being his Jewish name. Um, <clears throat> he said to him, follow me. Follow me. And so Jesus, after this, he is talking to Matthew, and I, I love how they portray in The Chosen. You, you can see that Jesus has been eyeing Matthew for a time. Um, and even though he didn't know him and he never talked to him before, but Matthew knows about all the goings on in the place, in his town and around his towns, because he has open has an open ear for things. He knows good uh, money wise. He knows good counting wise. Um, he has left his family. His family is disgraced because of him. So they they don't they don't own him anymore. Um, so he can't visit his family. He's alone. He's alone, but he's he's rich, and he's got a big house and plenty of things, right? And so he knows all the goings-on in, in the area. And so he knows what Jesus has been doing, even if he doesn't know Jesus or hasn't seen him and talked to him, all right? So he said to him, Jesus said to him, the only two words that Jesus said to him, firstly, is, follow me. 
And so, understanding how almost everyone hated tax collectors, hates tax collectors, it is remarkable to see how Jesus loved and called Matthew. It was a well-placed love, right? Matthew responded to Jesus' invitation by leaving everything. He left his whole tax collecting business, his guard of Roman soldiers, because with, without them, people still wouldn't know him that he was a tax collector, right? And so even if he was just a tax collector and they say that he's done tax collecting people, people still, people don't forget, right? So if he's done tax collecting people he and he doesn't have his Roman guards with him, He's given up everything. People still are going to remember that, right? Because he was this way, right? Just think about that. Think about that, all right? Because we're going to get into that a little bit. Um, and so Matthew leaves everything, all right? So in one way, <clears throat> this was more than a sacrifice than some of the other disciples made, right? So Peter, James, and John, they could easily, more than easily, go back to their fisherman job, right? Go back to their fishing business with their father, um, with their family. But for Matthew, it would be very hard to get back into tax collecting because he's leaving the Romans and he's leaving all that he has done. And they're, they're seeing it now as betrayal as well because he was, he was one of their best tax collectors. He was their informant and extortionist, giving them plenty of money. So it would be extremely hard for him to get back into that. Tax collector jobs were greatly sought after as a sure way to get rich quickly. So there was probably plenty of people in line for that as well. Um, there, I've got a note here in my commentary. It says, There is archaeological evidence that fish taken from the Sea of Galilee were taxed. So Jesus took as his disciple the tax man that took money from Peter, James, and John and the other fishermen among the disciples. I love that. I love hearing that because seeing that in The Chosen as well, um, of seeing how the interaction between Matthew and uh, Peter Peter and Andrew had already be begun quite a bit and that they, they really didn't like Matthew at all because he was trying to extort them. He was trying to get them in big trouble and almost did if it weren't for Jesus. All right? And so... Um, this dynamic between them, you can see that and how they really did hate tax collectors and how Jesus took for himself and he asked Matthew to follow him. He called Matthew who had already tax collect, who had already taxed his own people for their fish and from their whole families and had hard things happen to them. And so we can see in just a few verses why Jesus did that, even though he never told his disciples why he did this for this their own dynamic, for their own learning, for our learning, that Jesus calls us to a family of God, to be disciples, of followers of Jesus, even with people who have had pasts, and maybe even pasts that hurt you in their past, and hurt your family. So, he says, he left all. It was probably a huge sacrifice, right? Because as we as we said, Matthew being one of the probably the richest disciple, because he was the, he was a tax collector, right? Probably the richest disciple. He had a big house. He had all the money. He had everything that he could have ever wanted, right? He had the American dream per se. Um, he had everything. So it was probably a considerable sacrifice, leaving everything that he owns here for. Jesus, someone that he's never met before, right? But he's heard about. He's heard about him. And then Jesus called him saying, follow me. And Matthew left all. So what can we take from that there? That no matter who you are, it's going to be harder if you have a lot of things, but it's going to be just as amazing if you... Just as amazing for you, to G for Jesus to call you, no matter if you have a little bit, for, as most of these disciples like the fishermen had, it's just going to be just as hard in your heart and just as amazing for Jesus, for you to follow Jesus when he calls you, as if you were rich and you had a lot of things. And it's going to be hard, maybe even harder, because you have a lot of things, right? Because as, as we see later, when Jesus talks to another rich man, he said, I can't give up all my stuff. 
So there's, it's going to be hard. But it's going to be just as amazing or maybe even more amazing for you to say, I've, I, I give up all my stuff for you because Christ is enough. That's the, that's the phrase that I keep going back to is Christ is enough. No matter what, no matter how much you want or how much you have or have given up or no matter how little that you have given up, Jesus Christ is enough. All right. So verses 29 to 32, we see right after he calls Matthew, Matthew wants to throw him a huge feast. So we see Levi gave Matthew, gave him a great feast in his own house, right? So he hasn't given up his whole house yet because he's going on with Jesus soon to leave everything, right? Um, in the chosen, we see that he, he gives his house, um, house key and everything to his parents. Um, and his parents didn't even want it. Um, because, of course, it was made from the money that he extorted from their own people. Um, but Matthew told them to, uh, to sell it or something so that they could gain from it and that he could take care of them in a way even though they didn't want him. And, or they didn't want him after what the job that he went to do. But now they were so great grateful to see that he went after the Messiah. So Matthew throws this huge party for them. This huge party, right? Jesus likes to party with sinners, right? So we see that. Um, then Levi, then Matthew, gave him a great feast in his own house. So Matthew gave up much to follow Jesus, right? He wasn't sad about it. He wasn't sad about it. He went right for it because he was very happy to say that Christ is enough for me and to give him a party because, for one reason, Matthew wanted to show his friends his friends, how many friends that he had, um, we don't know, but maybe he had a few friends, um, and people in the area, or maybe even some Romans come, um, that a saved man doesn't want to go to heaven to loan. Matthew wanted to show them, I've got a friend named Jesus, who is the Messiah, and I'm following him. Their scribes and the Pharisees complained against his disciples. So we see in this, they're partying, they're having a good time, and so the Pharisees are there. The Pharisees are joining in this feast, right? So the Pharisees must have been some of his friends that were there to the feast. Scribes, they're at the feast. And they say, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Right? So they're complaining to his disciples, Jesus' disciples, right? But Jesus hears and Jesus answers. Right? So they're... These Pharisees and scribes are complaining because they are eating at the same table. They see it. They're eating at the same table, attending the same feast with them. In The Chosen, I believe that um, it portrays them that they weren't at the feast, but they were walking by and saw them through the, through the window, or maybe there was, it, was, it was a loud party, I think. I forget how they portrayed a loud party, and um, they're walking by or something like that, and then they see that Jesus the Messiah that they had seen before teaching and then they healed the people, healed the paralytic person was there and eating with these sinners. They're like, oh, what's going on here? For if, if they were Pharisees, if they themselves are Pharisees, right? Teachers of the law, they're not going to be eating with sinners. They're not going to be partying with sinners, right? And so Jesus tells us a great, a great thing here. All right. Um, let me read this uh, quote from Morgan real quick. It says, Nothing puzzled the religionists, the Pharisees, of the Lord's time more than his eating and drinking on terms of familiarity with publicans and sinners. Here he revealed the reason for doing so. He was among men as the great physician, right? So we see this. Jesus says, Those who are well have no need of a physician. So Jesus' answer here was both simple and yet profound. Jesus is the great physician of the soul, right? It makes sense for him to be with those who are sick and who are in need of a physician, right? So of course Jesus' critics have no sin, right? Of course they, they have no sin, for they cannot be sitting and dining with sinners, right? So trying to win them if they had no sin. So there are many possible reasons why a sick person might refuse the services of a doctor, right? There's many possible reasons. Perhaps you don't know that you are sick, right? 
if you refuse a doctor but you are sick, maybe you don't, you don't know that you are sick, perhaps you know you are sick but you think you will get better on your own, you don't know that you need to go to a doctor, you can see the implications of these right with Jesus. Perhaps you know you are sick and know you need a doctor, but do not know there is a doctor to help you. There's a great physician. Perhaps you know that you are sick and know that there that you need a doctor, and there is a doctor, but you do not know the doctor can help you. Right? Two more. Perhaps you know you are sick and know you need a doctor and know there is a doctor and you know the doctor can help you, but do not know the doctor wants to help you. All right, one more. Perhaps you know you are sick. You know you need a doctor. You know there is a doctor. You know the doctor can help you and you know the doctor wants to help you, but you know what the doctor will tell you to do and you just don't want to do it. So as you see that build up, there's many different reasons why people won't choose the great physician. It goes from don't know they're sick to knowing all these things and the doctor wants to help them and can, but they know what he's going to say and they don't want to do it. They don't want to follow after him. They don't want to be with God forever. They don't want to be praising God forever. They don't want to be with God in his great love forever. Maybe they want to be in heaven, but they don't want to be with God in his great love and praising him and glorifying him forever. They don't want to follow after Jesus. Maybe they want things and blessings, but they don't want to follow after Jesus. Right? So Jesus is the perfect, the great physician to heal us of all our sin. He is always available. He's never out on visits where he can't see, see you He's never out. He's always available. He always makes a perfect diagnosis. He always makes a perfect diagnosis. It's never, it's never wrong. It's never an error. It is always perfect that you are a sinner, that I am a sinner in need of a Savior. He provides a complete cure for that sin. He provides a complete cure, not, not a yearly re-up. It's a complete cure that is forever that is his grace, that is his blood poured out for you to atone for all of your sins. Complete cure. And he, get this, he even pays the bill. <laughs> so the perfect, amazing, great physician who does all these things, always available, always makes the perfect diagnosis, and always provides a complete cure, and he always pays the bill. You don't have to pay anything. It is completely undeserved that you get that freely. The grace of God offered freely to all sinners. For Jesus says, after being the great physician, he says, For I did not come to call the righteous, but to call sinners to repentance. So, I might ask for you today, for myself, to encourage as well, is that we can follow after Jesus wholeheartedly and not worry about things that we're giving up like Matthew. Matthew followed after him and gave up everything to follow after Jesus. And he was happy about it, to throw a feast. And then he sees that Jesus ate with sinners. And the Pharisees question this, right? And then Jesus tells them, well, I'm eating with these people because... If, they, if um, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. So Jesus isn't going to do any good being the great physician and not going to the people who are not well. Right? Same thing with us. He says, though I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. The same thing with us. We can go and eat. We can go and eat and be friends and witness and minister to our lost friends, to those who are in need of a physician, those who are sick, in need of a physician. Go and eat and dine and witness and proclaim the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ unto those. Because Christ is the great physician that everything he gives is for everybody. Because for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. For you and me, 
And everyone in this world is a sinner, has fallen short of the glory of God. He says, I've come to call the, the sinners to repentance, not the righteous. So you don't have to go and look out for people who look good Christians, those who don't have tattoos, those who don't have earrings, all the people who might look good as Christians. We are called to go after all people, to go after those who know they need a physician because Jesus is the great physician, right? He says, I have not come to call the righteous but sinners to repentance, to repent and to give their life up to the Lord, to follow after him, right? As Matthew did, he gave his life up for the Lord. Not to add on to his life, another thing, but to give his life up for the Lord and to now lead a new life with the Lord in replacement of his old one. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Hope you guys have a great day and take this to know how great a physician Jesus is and what he's done for you to tell of it to others. Have a great day, guys. God bless.